All right, good afternoon. Welcome back. Hopefully everybody had a nice relaxing lunch or a productive lunch if you had to catch up on a lot of emails from the day. Um, we are coming to our fifth and last session, which will be on impacts on California wildlife and their connections. Our moderator for this last session is Whitney Albright. Whitney Albright is a climate change specialist with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, where she works to incorporate climate change consideration into various programs and activities at the department to support the adaptation of fish and wildlife to climate impacts. Uh, Ms. Albright is also part of the Department of Science Institute, helping to maintain and improve the quality and integrity of science that is produced and used by the department including climate science. Whitney holds a bachelor's in meteorology from the University of Oklahoma and a master's in forestry from the University of Washington. Welcome Whitney and uh, thank you for moderating the fifth session. Great, thank you Orit for the introduction. Um, I'm really very honored to be here today serving as the moderator for this session and I'm happy to have had the opportunity to join the workshop yesterday as well and absorb all this great information. So I'm feeling very fortunate. Uh, as you know, this particular session this afternoon is all about climate impacts on California wildlife and their connections. Uh, throughout the course of the session, we'll be hearing about observed impacts of climate change to terrestrial, aquatic, and marine environments. So really nice sampling of different California uh, ecosystem types and species. And these talks will, of course, build on the information that we've heard previously throughout the workshop, um, both from conversations yesterday, as well as the session this morning on vegetation, which is really a perfect precursor to a session on wildlife. So I expect that we'll see lots of connections between the two. Uh, before we dive in, I was asked to give just a quick bit of background on myself and kind of my perspective coming into the session today. Uh, as Orit mentioned, I work within the Science Institute at the Department of Fish and Wildlife based out of our office here in Sacramento. And I work at a pretty kind of broad level helping to identify what are the biggest climate related risks to the resources that we manage and what can we do and, and should we do to minimize those risks and create a more resilient landscape. And so within the department, a big part of my job is, is supporting staff across our different programs and regions and helping them to find the resources and the information that they need in order to incorporate climate science and adaptation into their work, which can really span all different types of applications from you know, environmental review, permitting, land management, species management, grant programs, all types of things. So for me to be here today and learn about the latest observed climatic changes and impacts from experts in the field is really so important uh, for a lot of reasons. And I suspect that many of you may feel the same way, but it helps me to really generally just better converse with colleagues and partners on the topic and be more kind of fluent in the language of climate change, but also to be able to point to solid science that supports and, and really provides additional justification for what we're doing um, and what we're trying to do in our adaptation efforts. So these linkages that we're identifying, making sure that we're talking and we're coordinated, so critical um, to you know help us do our jobs effectively. So this is really a great workshop um, to be having and to get to be a part of. Uh, before I introduce our first speaker, just a couple of quick reminders. We're gonna have uh, four presentations during the session today, followed by about 30 minutes for panel discussion at the end. So I encourage you to type your questions into the Q&A box as they arise while they're fresh. Um, and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can during the discussion. And if you have a question that's specific to an individual presenter, please feel free to denote that in your question so we can make sure to root it uh, accordingly. Okay, so without further ado, our first speaker of the session today is Joanna Wu with the National Audubon Society. And Ms. Wu has worked at Audubon since 2016 doing data and GIS analysis and management of the important bird areas program. Joanna led Audubon's 2018 Birds and Climate Change in our National Parks scientific publication and then went on to complete similar projects with Parks Canada and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And she's now one of the scientists behind the 2020 Climate Change Vulnerability Project. So today, Joanna will be talking about both observed and projected impacts of climate change to birds in California. And with that, I will turn it over to you. Uh, 
All right, thanks a lot, Whitney, and good afternoon to everyone. So I am really pleased to be here today to talk a little bit about um, both, like Whitney said, observed changes and also future projected changes, which is the, the bulk of the work I'll be talking about with um, that I did at Audubon here. So we heard a lot of, from the previous presenters about some of the physiological aspects of climate change and how it impacts our human communities. Now I'm going to be transi transitioning to wildlife. And one question right off the bat is why birds? Well, for one, they're very fragile. They can move around better than humans and um, most other species here. And they, as such, they are ecological indicators of changing systems. We can study them of what sorts of changes might have incurred. And we are ornithologists are also very lucky in that we have relatively extensive and long-term data sets available for avian species, um, particularly with data sets like Christmas bird count, eBird, and Grinnell resurvey projects, which Steve will talk about a little more today. So in thinking about bird survival, there are a lot of different factors that go into that, such as competition, disease, etc. And climate is only one of the many factors that impact bird survival. And that's the one that I'll be focusing on today. The first part of my talk will, will go over some of the historic impacts on birds in the West. This follows a review done by my colleague Nat CV and collaborators at Point Blue Conservation Science. Um, and they I kind of have this framework of, <clears throat> of talking about historical impacts in these, two, these four fields or timing, morphology and physiology, distribution, and population size impacts. I'll go through each of them in more detail. The first is uh, thinking about bird phenology. We have some studies across North America that, I that are finding in several species, birds are advancing their breeding dates. So they're breeding earlier and earlier as springtime conditions um, become suitable earlier in the season. Uh, several local on American kestrels in Idaho found that spring arrival and breeding dates are advancing. The same arrival dates has also been found to advance for robins in Colorado and breeding dates are advancing for Mexican jays in Arizona. In terms of songbirds in Central California, many arrival dates are advancing, but some are retreating. So it's, an, it's not a completely straightforward. It's a little bit of a nuanced picture here. In terms of and physiology, the expectation um, according to Bergman's rule is that body size would be reduced to reduce cooling costs in um, as temperatures warm. In reality, that's a little bit more nuanced again. A study uh, in the desert did find that there, there was an increase in cooling costs in the Mojave Desert over the last century, and that species that, that were able to reduce their body size saved a little bit of cooling costs less decline, but it wasn't enough to make up for the increase in cooling costs. Another, the study in Central California investigated land bird body sizes at two banding sites and found that wing length and in many cases body mass had actually increased. So it didn't follow the predictions perfectly there. And um, the next approach I want to mention is thinking about birds in terms of we distribution looks at changes in where the birds are over time. So this doesn't look at population declines, which I'll talk about next, but just a couple of landmark studies that, that look at where birds are distributed across North America, birds are found to um, shift northward toward the poles as temperatures warm, and they're tr uh, trying to perhaps track their climates. A couple of landmark studies in California found that 90% of their climatic niche, but um, the picture is a little bit more nuanced in that in the lower elevation of their limits, they tended to be driven by precipitation, whereas the upper, elevation, upper elevation limits were driven more by temperature. This last study here, Ikningen and Bisinger found that um, there was a decrease in occupancy in sites across the Mojave Desert, with the common raven really being the only winner species decreased in where they were, uh, which sites they were occupying. 
And they thought that was related to the de decrease in rain rainfall over 100 years. Next, I want to talk a little bit more about population sizes. So these are the actual numbers of birds within, within particular areas. The California towhee in the breeding season has found to have varied trends. They're declining in Northern California and parts of the but then these areas in yellow and the blues are where the populations are increasing over time. If we look at a bird like the California quail in winter, this is using Christmas bird count data, the, the trend of the quail has been declining in winter um, over a 50 year time period, but in several other states, it's increasing in winter. So again, kind of a complex, birds may respond. So I briefly covered the sum of the ways that birds have responded historically in the West. Now I want to look forward and, 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 and think about well how might the ranges of birds look like in the future. We are our colleagues at Audubon modeled a potential future for over 600 North American bird species and we said well if this is where a bird currently is what do we know about the limit the, the factors that limit their distribution and how that might change and how that might in turn drive where birds might be distributed in the future. So we took over 140 million individual observations from 70 data sources and added bioclimatic variables like climate and precipitation. Um, we also added human land use projections and vegetation projections for the future and also habitat specific variables such as global cover for wetland birds. And we overlaid those and made predictions for the future. This is an animation that goes from current to the one and a half degree warming scenario to two to three degree scenario. The areas in red are where the western bluebird could lose its wintering range. And the areas in the very pale blue there are areas of potential gain. And if we overlap all species in both breeding and non-breeding seasons, we might get to see um, a, a potential future of, of net change in species. We can start to identify regions that are hotspots for, for losses and regions that are hotspots for gains. For example, in the breeding season in summer, the boreal forest comes out as a, a strong site where species may not may be lost from those areas. Um, and in the non-breeding season, a lot of is, and Canada are gaining species of potentially as winter conditions warm. Um, but I want to point out that, that California is unique in that we already host a lot of species in the winter and we might, we might could stand to lose a few of those species in the future. Another thing we assessed is vulnerability. This is based on several studies cited here. I'm not going to go into great detail, but climate vulnerability of the sensitivity and adaptive capacity. So we looked at the potential range gain of a species and where it might potentially lose area. And then we um, classified species into non-vulnerable or vulnerable, these moderate and high categories. And then we, um, we found that overall two thirds or 390 North American species assessed are vulnerable to climate changes impact degrees of warming. Reducing emissions to one and a half degrees Celsius improves vulnerability rankings for 76% of those species. Another thing we did is we overlaid every um, the lower 48 states with climate related threats that birds may face in addition to just um, the modeled variables there. So we looked at things like sea level rise, urbanization, cropland expansion, fire weather, rain, etc. And I'll go over the maps outputs of each of these. And mapping these threats, which are important not only for wildlife, but for humans and particularly vulnerable human populations as well. We found that um, that these are the areas where the threat is projected to severely intensify over the next, um, over the, these warming scenarios, with the areas in red being areas that the threat would out of three degree warming scenario. 
and the areas in orange being the areas the threat would would um, affect um, in a one and a half degree warming scenario. So extreme spring heat is our most prevalent threat, and it is, and all these threats combined are projected to affect 98% of the birds we assess under a three degree warming scenario. We took, we took those threats and overlapped them and looked at for each location, how many climate related threats might an area face. And under a one and a half and three degree scenario, California might face up to six threats, coincident threats in one location. And again, you can see that these threats are, are again lessened at a mitigated one and a half degree warming scenario. Next, I wanna shift gears a little bit and look at a few particular and, and our potential projections for them. Um, one example is the yellow-billed magpie, which is extra special because it's a species that's only found in California and nowhere else. Um, it unfortunately may lose 100% of its present range in both seasons as, as a species just due to its projected climate changes. But again, the loss drops to 30% if we were to cap emissions to one and a half degrees. Some of the threats that this bird could face are urbanization, extreme spring heat, and the risk of extreme fire weather. Another bird to highlight here is the California quail, our state bird. It is a bird that uh, may lose 90% of its present range in the winter, which is shown here, and about 45% in summer. Again, the loss is um, halved if we capped emissions to one and a half. The same threats overlap with the range of the California quail as the magpie. So again, um, just returning to the big picture, there are certainly a lot of factors that go into the survival of a bird and climate is the only one that I touched upon. And within climate, I only talked about the distribution component of, of what a, the potential future could look like. But it suffice to say that, that birds are indicating they uh, respond to all these changing conditions and can give us inf important information about how these conditions are changing and what we can do. A good indicator should connect people and leave them inspired to, to action. Birds are well suited to do this because the um, pe people are, are heavily invested in birding. Um, the science shows that reducing warming can make a difference for birds and people can the scientific process of measuring change, which is to me one of the most exciting components of this work. Um, for example, we are putting out a, we have a, a community science project called Climate Watch, where you go out and do point count surveys of, of birds in your neighborhood. And these, these are analyzed in a statistically rigorous way that can ver help verify whether our climate projections were, were, were wrong or right. And ultimately that's the to help us and give feedback on, on where we can improve. And with that, um, you know, it's, it's exciting. Birds motivate me every day because we, they motivate us to do better for, for both animals and wildlife and humans as well. With that, I wanna thank you for your time and I will turn it back to Whitney. All right. Thank you very much, Joanna. Um, let's, we'll keep it moving right along here. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Steve Beisinger. And Dr. Beisinger is a professor of ecology and conservation biology at UC Berkeley. And he is also a research associate at the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology and co-directs the Berkeley Institute for Parks, People, and Biodiversity. Professor Beisinger's current research centers on wildlife responses to global change and species extinction. And he directs the Grinnell Resurvey Project, an effort to revisit locations throughout California, first surveyed by Joseph Grinnell in the early 1900s. So today, Steve, Steve will be talking more of, uh, in depth about that work and his efforts to quantify the impacts of a century of climate and land use change on the, uh, or impact on the birds and mammals of California. So Steve, please take it away. All 
Okay, thank you. Here we go. Hopefully you guys can all see me and hear me at the moment. Great. Um, thank you, Wendy, and uh, thank you, Joanna, for that uh, great introduction to the work that I do want to talk about today. Um, we are fortunate in California to have a baseline that Joseph Grinnell and colleagues collected for us in the early 1900s. And Grinnell knew he was doing this. Uh, this quote hung on the museum wall for many years before and, and inspired um, Craig Moritz, um, Jim Patton and I to launch the Grinnell Resurvey Project in the early 2000s. And Grinnell realized that in, in a century, assuming his material would be safely preserved, that the student of the future would have access to the original faunal record and conditions in California in the West, wherever we work now. Well, Grinnell worked kind of everywhere. And uh, the dots indicate places where specimens were collected, sized by the number of specimens. Um, the triangles are, are sorry, the rectangles are transects that Grinnell was interested in to understand the role of climate. So they were more intensely sampled. And in addition to specimens, Grinnell and colleagues left us field notebooks, which have much more information about the species they saw and the effort they did to encounter them there. So using that information, it's been our job to reconstruct that baseline. And we began in Yosemite National Park, um, a, a, a transect that went from the Central Valley uh, up over the alpine areas of the park and, and into the east side. And as Professor Ackerley talked about this morning, um, the small mammals showed us good evidence that they were responding to climate change. Uh, he showed this picture um, where you can see the green places where elevations were, ranges had expanded, mostly up if you were a low to mid elevation species, but sometimes down. And if you were a mid to high elevation species where the elevations contracted upward, a sort of fingerprint that you might expect from climate change. But as you look closer and you recognize half the species didn't change, and close relatives, congenerics, indicated by the same colors here, were doing different things in the same places. So when we looked at the birds, we saw the same kind of variation. And when we expanded this spatially to include transects in the Northern Sierras at Lassen Volcanic National Park from the Central Valley up there, and the Southern Sierras through Kings Canyon Sequoia in the Central Valley, we had species moving up, one place moving down in another and doing nothing in the third. It's this variation that perplexes biologists in trying to understand the changes that have taken place. And some of it in retrospect, we should have realized because exposure to climate change is different in these different places in California and climate change since Grinnell has been lumpy. It's been substantial in many places warming over a degree, but it's also been lumpy. And you can see here the average temperatures, the minimum temperatures, which have changed much faster than anything else. And the change in annual precipitation differs across the state. In fact, in the northern part of the state around uh, parts of Lassen and Shasta, there's actually evidence of cooling and wetting relative to many other parts of the state that are showing warming and drying. In fact, the place that's been most transformed by climate, arguably, has been the deserts. And as you heard this morning in, in the talk about vegetation in the Mojave Desert, this is a hot spot, literally. So it's warming and drying. Let's go down there now and see what the changes that have taken place. Well, Grinnell and others were in the Mojave. It's an area that's had climate change, but not land use change. And most of the surveys were done in the early 1900s. Uh, Jim Patton and uh, his partner, Carol Patton, and the San Diego Natural History Museum worked with us to repeat those small mammal surveys at 90 sites for 34 species. Grinnell and others were collecting in the early 1900s. We use live traps now, although we take some specimens. I think if the student of the future looks at us and asks what we could have done better, 
they're going to wish for more specimens had we per been permitted to do so. For the birds, Kelly Ichnian, who finished a PhD uh, in my lab, um, worked on this project and she resurveyed birds uh, throughout the Mojave Desert as well as in parts of the Great Basin. Um, the early work was done by a variety of a Grinnellian student through Berkeley and Grinnell himself, dating back to the early 1900s. So our surveys there go from sea level up to high elevation. Um, and as it has been alluded from the previous talk, from Joanna's talk, uh, the birds and the mammals are showing very different responses to climate change. And this is fascinating. The same area, the same region, two thirds of the sites that we visited had both kinds of surveys done, but vastly different changes. Uh, the mammals are showing stability. Over the past century, if we look at the proportion of sites that a species occupied, its historic occupancy, and the proportion of sites that a species has found now, there's very little change. This, the species in blue had a significant but small increase. The species in red had a significant but small decline. The birds, on the other hand, show evidence of a community collapse. Proportion of sites that species are occupying now is much lower. Only the common raven over here is showing an expansion. 39 of the 135 species that we surveyed declined. So overall, when we go to a site now, almost half, 42% of the species are missing that were there when Grinnell we surveyed. So you can see the whole community has, richness has greatly decreased. Not true for the mammals. In fact, overall, as you can see, most species, these gray dots show no significant change in species richness, most sites. So what is going on that is showing us such different responses in the same place? Well, with the birds, we, we found out was that they were very sensitive to climate change. Uh, there was no significant relationship with fire or fire return intervals or grazing, um, but there were very significant changes uh, with change in precipitation. Um, there was little colonization of new sites, but their persistence at sites where species had been was greatly reduced if sites dried. Mean temperature and maximum temperature didn't show much of an effect but drying was especially important. And the effect on persistence was greater, as you might expect, in sites that are warmer and sites that are drier, that have less precipitation. So these are places where you might expect the physiological limits of climate change to be the greatest. And in fact, that was our next task. So Eric Riddell, a postdoc who worked with me in, on this project, uh, worked to develop a way to understand exposure. And the way that he did it was to create a physiological bird in his computer and to look at how it absorbed the radiation, both direct and long wave radiation, as well as to create a physiological mammal and do the same thing. Of course, during the day, the mammals are underground, so they're not being exposed, um, except for a few that are diurnal and can run back into those burrows. But at night, that's when the mammals are coming out and becoming exposed in a greater degree to a lot of these changes. So this model takes these uh, physiological measures based on first principles of physics, but for each species, we do have to know its body size, its feather length, its barbule densities and insulation depth of the fur and things like that to help us to model this. And the cool thing about this model is we could validate it. So we could measure species like this common goldfinch, um, the characteristics, the traits that are important. Uh, the cactus wren or the morning dove you might've heard this morning in your yard. And we can look at how much water would be required to expend to keep the body temperature within the physiological limits. That's the red, the cooling costs that we call them. And you can see that the cooling costs increase as you get to the middle of the hottest parts of the day and they increase with species with bigger body sizes. And there's a great relationship between lab studies that have been done to estimate these costs and our model estimations of them. So when we go to apply them now across all the species of birds and mammals, 
in our surveys, we find that the cooling costs for mammals in blue, the histogram, the percent of the species, hardly changed at all. Whereas for the birds, you can see that they increased 3.3 times over what they were when Grinnell and others were doing their studies. That's the direct physiological effect of climate change on these birds. And the cooling costs in the future, well, that is, that's the change in cooling costs just associated with the climate itself. Now for the sensitivity. That is species that experienced more cooling costs, increase in those cooling costs, were much more likely to show declines in occupancy. So those with the greatest increase showed the greatest declines. And also the effects were different with birds with different diet types. Carnivores and insectivores that get nearly all of their water from the food that they eat show a much stronger relationship in the change in cooling costs, the increase in cooling costs, and the level of decline that they occur. All right, so we have this direct connection now uh, between climate change and the changes we saw for the birds and not the changes we saw for the mammals. What about the other global change? Grinnell wasn't thinking about climate change, he was thinking about land use change. And we in California have many places that agriculture has made incredible changes to land use in California. But even in the Central Valley, there are still places on the edges of the valley, for example, that haven't been transformed. Likewise, urbanization is a big threat. And Grinnell recognized this because he grew up in California, in Pasadena. Here's his neighborhood. He was keeping bird lists while he was growing up as a kid. And we were able to repeat those. Sarah uh, McLean, who did her PhD work on this, repeated these surveys all throughout the Los Angeles Basin and the Central Valley. And the thing that Sarah was brave enough to do was to reconstruct the land use change. That held us back before. By digitizing topo maps, by using old agricultural maps, and giving us measures of urban change, agricultural change, and water cover change. And here is Sacramento. Some of you are sitting maybe nearby. This is what your neighborhood looks like today, where those resurveys took place. What did we find? Well, interestingly, if we look at a histograms for the Central Valley of the proportion of change of species, and also Los Angeles for the proportional change of species, each one of these little bars is a species. You can see in Central Valley, there is a small overall change, a decline in occupancy. That is, uh, fewer sites where species are found, but there were clear winners that expanded through this region, both non-native and native species, and there were clear losers that declined. Um, if you look in Los Angeles, there are far fewer winners, and there are a lot more losers. And in fact, the level of decline, 40% of these species declining significantly, is pretty similar to what we were seeing for the large scale decline for birds in the Mojave Desert. So here we are seeing the effects of land use and climate change, maybe actually having some pretty similar effects. When we go back and we look overall to a site, if we go back to a site now, there's not a significant change over all these sites in species richness in the Central Valley. Yes, there's some sites that did decline and others that increased. You go back to Los Angeles on average, we have about a third of the species there as we're at these sites when Grinnell was growing up. So could we understand both of these effects? We can through the occupancy modeling framework that corrects for differences in detection. We can understand them and we can attribute them to these changes in climate. So historically, in the early 20th century, climate was mostly responsible for where species were found. These are the number of species that were significantly positively in green or negatively related to precipitation or temperature or the amount of urban agriculture or water cover. And you can see uh, climate was really what distributed species, but the change species that either colonized unoccupied sites or persisted at sites where they already were, 
the strongest effects, the strongest means across the entire community were driven by precipitation. Here's precipitation again, rather than temperature being the key factor. And also um, urbanization. Some species benefited from urbanization, interestingly, but their persistence across most species in the community was driven negatively. Agriculture had a secondary effect as well, um, although there were far fewer species that were affected negatively by agriculture. And finally, if we take these two threats together, because of course, they both are happening in our region, we can take our model and ask, well, what if only land use change happened and no climate change happened? How would a species respond? What if no climate change happened? I'm sorry, what if no land use change happened and only climate change happened? How would they respond? So for the average site in Los Angeles and the average site of Central Valley, each of these dots is a species. And they're color coded by species who declined significantly over the past century in their occupancy in red or expanded in green or didn't change significantly in blue. Um, so this what if question, uh, Professor Ackerley this morning described as a counterfactual. Well, of course it's changed, but what if it hadn't? We can put in the parameters into our model, ask that question and see in, the, in Los Angeles, a lot of species suffer a double whammy from land use change and climate change. Um, there are a few species that had a windfall and for many they're being pulled in opposite directions. In the Central Valley, uh, we see more species that had a windfall from climate change and land use change. Species being positively affected by both, probably because the Central Valley actually got wetter since Grinnell's time. And that may have driven colonization in those areas. All right, to conclude, let me just say that um, despite all the work we've been doing for such a long time in the region, in, in the area of global change and climate, we still have a lot to learn about how to measure exposure for species, how to understand their sensitivity, and how to understand their adaptive capacity. These will be the three things that will probably most influence how species in California will respond and which ones will be good indicators in which ecosystems. Um, we need to understand these better. Uh, we need to have research programs that are able to integrate across them and to do it at a scale that's meaningful. Um, we're finally at the point now, having revisited uh, over 300 sites throughout California that we can uh, use our measures of past change and project the future, at least for the birds. Uh, the mammals we don't have in as many places, but we're finally ready to do that. Um, I think I'll stop now. Thank you. Great. Thank you. It's really interesting to see the impacts of climate change and land use a side by side like that instead of looking at those variables in isolation, like we sometimes tend to do. All right, I'll introduce our next speaker now. Um, we have next up Dr. Stephen Bograd. And Dr. Bograd is an oceanographer at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's Southwest Fisheries Science Center Environmental Research Division in Monterey, California. And he holds a research associate position at Scripps Institution of Oceanography and an adjunct faculty position in the Department of Ocean Sciences at UC Santa Cruz. And Stephen's research is focused on physical biological interactions, eastern boundary current systems, climate variability, marine biologging, and fisheries oceanography. And today, Dr. Bograd will be talking about his current research pertaining to the impacts of climate driven and anthropogenic pressures on Pacific Coast marine ecosystems. And with that, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Whitney, for the introduction. And I'm really happy to be at this very interesting and important workshop. Um, so yeah, I'm going to move into the marine realm now uh, and talk about impacts of climate-driven and anthropogenic pressures on Pacific Coast marine ecosystems. 
And <clears throat> I want to thank uh, a number of my colleagues from the Climate Ecosystem Group in Monterey um, who have helped provide content for this presentation, um, as well as the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment and the NIMPS West Coast Regional Office. So there are many stressors that um, have an impact on the marine environment off the coast of California, and that could have cumulative impacts on the marine ecosystem. And I list a few of the, the really big ones here, fishing, bycatch, shipping, coastal development, offshore energy development, pollution, and of course, climate change, which I'll talk a little bit more about later. So this map on the, on the left here is a, a really nice summary um, from a paper by Sarah Maxwell and colleagues where she mapped out the distribution within the California current system of about, I think, 24 anthropogenic stressors. And these were compiled by Ben Halpern and his colleagues at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Um, and these were weighted by several top predator species that inhabit for at least part of their life cycles, the California current system. And that includes seabirds, marine mammals, and, um, and even the uh, endangered leatherback turtle. So we could see that the, the coastal domain is where you're seeing the, the highest level of uh, these cumulative stressors. And then if we look at where these different species are actually utilizing habitat within the California current, so again, that's mostly in the coastal zone off of central and northern California. And if we combine those, we get the map on the right here. Uh, and this is the cumulative impacts, uh, cumulative utilization and impacts map. So what this is showing are regions where this particular group of species are most impacted by and most at risk by this suite of stress, stressors, both anthropogenic uh, and climate uh, related stressors. Uh, and we see that there's uh, a number of hotspots here all along the California coast, um, especially from around Point Conception on up to uh, Point Arena and Cape Mendocino. Uh, so this can inform uh, marine spatial planning uh, and the like. And then if we think uh, more about, sorry, if we think more about um, the climate stressors, the California current system, um, as many of you know, is highly productive, has um, a very high biological diversity, and that's driven by coastal upwelling, seasonal coastal upwelling. So we can imagine that changes in the intensity um, and the timing of coastal upwelling will have a, a major impact on the ecosystem not just the productivity, but also um, changes in, in predator-prey interactions and, and mismatches. So these are the phenological issues that Joanna mentioned earlier. We're also seeing um, increases in ocean acidification and deoxygenation, more hypoxic events on the continental shelf, uh, of course, ocean warming, and changes in intensity um, and frequency of extreme events. And that's been you know, a key point of this particular workshop where we've seen these, these really massive climate events over the last few years that have impacted our region from forest fires, drought. Um, and then what I'm gonna talk about in particular here, um, again, going into the marine well, realm, are marine heat wet waves. So for example, the blob, which I'm sure you've, you've all probably heard about and we heard a little bit about yesterday as well. <clears throat> so um, I mentioned the blob. So that um, developed in the North Pacific around 2013-14 winter. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, but really, it, it kind of inspired and set off this, this um, explosion of interest um, in the scientific community of marine heat waves, as reflected here by this um, exponential increase in the number of publications for the terms marine heat wave. Um, and that's continued over, over uh, more recent years as well. And if we look at where these heat waves are, we can see it's a global phenomenon. So this is um, maps showing sea surface temperature anomalies um, for a number of these larger and more persistent marine heat waves um, that were compiled in, in this paper by Furlicker and, and Lockcrofter. Um, so we can see that they're happening um, really in, in, all, in all ocean basins and hemispheres, um, in the coastal regions of Australia, of Europe, North America. Um, and for today's talk, I'm gonna focus specifically on this event, um, the blob and post blob period, uh, and talk a little bit about how that um, event evolved and what the ecological changes and impacts were associated with that event. Okay, so looking at this a little more, um, 
in detail. So these again are maps of sea surface temperature anomaly, so changes from the long-term mean um, in the North Pacific region for the top row is 2013-14, and then 2014-15 is the middle row, and the bottom row is 2015-16. Um, and the reds here are the particularly warm ocean anomalies. And the thing that really stands out is that really the whole region was, was pretty much red uh, during this period of time. So this in fact was um, for this region, the warmest three year period um, on record. So highly anomalous conditions that impacted um, our coast here. And if we focus just on the winter period, we could see a little bit about how um, this event evolved and, and changed dynamically. Um, so um, as I mentioned earlier, this, this blob um, began in the winter of 2013-14 up here in the northern North Pacific Gulf of Alaska region. Um, as I think Marisol described yesterday, um, this was driven by this persistent, resilient um, North Pacific high, um, this ridge um, that uh, presided over the North Pacific, uh, reduced cooling uh, and mixing in the, in the uh, upper ocean, um, steered storm tracks uh, further north, and you ended up getting this, what looks like a blob of, of uh, heating and these large um, sea surface temperature anomalies. And that persisted into the next year, um, but the pattern changed um, and some interesting dynamics about that um, into this more arc warming pattern where we see very warm temperatures all along uh, the entire west coast of North America. Um, and that persisted again um, until the next year. And to top it all off, we had this very large El Nino event that occurred that uh, developed in the tropics in 2015. El Nino events also have a very um, big impact on the California uh, current um, ecosystem and coastal region, as well as the state of California uh, in terms of lowering productivity and warming the, uh, the upper ocean. Um, so what we see from this uh, this three-year period was this highly anomalous conditions. Even though it evolved dynamically, um, we see this persistence of these warm um, SST anomalies throughout the region. And so not only the scientific community was interested in this and, and grabbed their attention, but it really grabbed the attention of, um, of the media and the general public as well. Uh, and you could see that these are just a few of the um, um, media uh, titles that we saw um, uh, during the time of the blob around 2014, 15, 16, the blob invading the Pacific, um, stirring up fisheries management, the Godzilla El Nino. One thing I would say is that, um, as Dr. Santer pointed out yesterday, language is very important and communicating to the public is very important. And, uh, you know, I, I think that even though th these names are, are maybe a little bit silly, the blob or the Godzilla El Nino, I think it resonates with the public and it provides an opening for us to get into the media and to talk to the public about these events and about climate change more generally. So whatever we call them, um, we certainly saw over the past few years what we might call a climate stress test on the California ecosystem. Um, both the marine ecosystem and the terrestrial ecosystem as well. So this, um, this diagram on the left is a, is a nice um, infographic that was put together by Mil Mike Milstein and, and some others uh, from, from NIMFS and West Coast Regional Office. Um, and it kind of walks us through the evolution of uh, these events, both um, how the ocean conditions changed as well as the, the ecological changes um, and the impacts um, uh, of both the, the ecosystem and um, on human societies as well. So if you look at um, the first uh, set of, of images here, this is showing the evolution of the, of the ocean conditions, which I mentioned a little bit earlier. 2013 was actually a year where um, we had fairly strong upwelling in the California current, fairly cool conditions. Um, but it was 2014, uh, as I mentioned, when the, the blob developed, as you see up here in the North Pacific. Um, there was little wind to, um, to cool the ocean. It developed. Upwelling slowed down. 
And then in 2015 and into 16 is when we really started seeing these impacts um, on the West Coast where this, uh, this marine heat wave really impacted our coastal zone. We had elevated temperatures uh, in the nearshore and offshore regions The El Nino developed. Um, and as we get into 2016 and into 2017, um, while things cooled off and got a little bit back to normal, off our coast, um, things remained very warm in the Gulf of Alaska and Bering Sea and up into the Arctic as well. So what were the ecological changes associated with this? Well, as I mentioned, 2013, we had pretty good upwelling. It was kind of a, a reasonably cool and, and productive year. Um, krill, which is one of the main uh, prey species uh, in our region, were, were plentiful. Uh, we saw sardines spawning further offshore, um, away from the cooler waters near the coast. But as the blob developed, um, we started to see species that were shifting northward into cooler waters that are, are more amenable to their preferred habitat. Um, we saw uh, you know, a number of warm water species like skipjack tuna found all the way up in Alaska. We saw uh, blue, bluefin tuna off of Oregon. And then as we got into 2015-16, when we really saw uh, the impact along the California coast, we saw some major pantrophic um, changes and, and responses in the California ecosystem, California current ecosystem. So the krill and other forage species began to decline. We saw a, a massive harmful algal bloom um, that spread in shellfish all the way from Southern California up to Alaska. We saw a number of, of fish species that moved northwards, um, in, in some cases by hundreds of miles um, into this cooler water. Juvenile salmon that were leaving our California rivers um, into the ocean uh, were finding poor quality food and, and not doing so well. Um, we saw this ex population explosion of pyrosomes um, further north than we've ever seen before. And then as we get into 2016, we really started to see some, some negative interactions uh, within our coastal uh, region. Um, so lacking the krill, um, humpback whales uh, were tending to feed um, on anchovy, which were compressed uh, near shore into the cooler waters. Um, and this is where the crab fishery operates. So we started to see um, interactions between uh, marine mammals, humpback whales in particular, uh, and this fishery. Um, saw large shifts in food web structure throughout the California current system, um, from crustaceans to more gelatinous organisms that had less value to fish, so um, decreased their, their um, body condition. Um, and again, pyrosomes multiplying um, to an extent never seen before. And finally getting back into, into more normal conditions in 2017, at least for a little while. What were the impacts? Well, you know, in California, we saw um, starting really in 2014, in the early, early um, stages of the blob, we saw sea lions stranding in large numbers. These are animals that are um, central place foragers, so they're, they're tied to their rookeries on land, um, and they weren't able to find the forage that they normally would find nearby. Um, so they started um, doing really poorly. So about 95% of endangered winter run Chinook salmon eggs that were lost to drought and a reduction in freshwater runoff. Then again, in 2015-16 is when we really started to see some, some major impacts uh, with clamming shut down. Um, the Dungeness crab season initially delayed by these harmful algal blooms. Um, I mentioned the, the over 4,000 stranded California sea lions and huge seabird die-offs. Um, we saw reduced size and survival of salmon that were entering the ocean, as well as cod um, further north in the, in the Gulf of Alaska. Fishing nets, when they went out, were, were being clogged with these pyrosomes. Uh, we did see in 2016 the Dungeness crab season open, which, as I'll talk about in a little more detail in a moment, um, ended up uh, with increased interactions with marine mammals, and in particular, um, increased whale entanglements. Fish uh, were smaller, poor uh, body condition, reduced salmon survival, uh, and sea lion strandings continued even into 2016 before finally things started to go back a little bit more to normal in 2017. And one thing I would note is that a lot of these biological impacts, especially at the higher trophic levels, are likely lagged quite a bit. So we may be seeing um, biological responses within the ecosystem 
from uh, even the Blob event back in, in 1415, 16, um, for even some years to come. So you didn't have to really um, even get your feet wet to see some of the, the odd things going on in the marine ecosystems. This is, this is a photo from a beach in Pacific Grove, California, where I live. And what you're seeing is strandings of thousands of these pelagic red crabs. And this is very, very unusual. Um, this is a warm water species that we normally see off of Baja, Mexico. Um, we rarely see them um, as far north as Monterey. In fact, we can go years or, or decades sometimes without ever seeing them. We ended up having several um, of these uh, red crab strandings in the Monterey Bay area between 2015 and 2018. Um, so that speaks to this idea that um, these warm water conditions not only um, brought these animals up here, they, they, um, their range expanded into these warmer waters much further north, um, but that persistence of those warm anomalies um, kept them around as well. So I mentioned this, um, you know, interactions between fisheries and marine mammals, and, you know, in this, in this sense, this is kind of a perfect storm, and sometimes these events happen where, um, you know, you really could not have anticipated it ahead of time necessarily. You know, we have warming of the, of the surface ocean, um, and then we end up having these events, this um, cascade of events that um, were unprecedented and, and really unexpected. So in this case, as I mentioned earlier, um, we had the, the cooler, low per, uh, higher productive waters were really compressed um, near to the coast during the marine heat wave period. So significant habitat compression, and this was especially the case for some of the um, important forage species like anchovy. Again, we saw this massive harmful algal bloom uh, along the entire coast, which led to fishery closures and delayed openings. Uh, when you did have openings, you ended up with an increased overlap um, between the fishery and whales and, and record whale entanglements uh, in, these, in these crab pots. Uh, and we could look at that uh, in a little more uh, detail here. This is an updated um, graph from the Nest, uh, West Coast Regional Office showing confirmed entanglement reports for whales um, in, in the region. Um, typically, as we saw in the early 2000s, you might have a handful of them. Um, but what we saw in 2015-16 were more than 50 uh, of these entanglements, mostly humpback whales, but a lot of gray whales and even blue whales as well. So a massive um, disruption um, on, on multiple levels, not just on the marine mammals, but on the crab fishery and the fishers as well, who's, um, you know, who were impacted in a socioeconomic sense um, by these entanglements and, and subsequent closures and delays in, in the fishing season. So to bring it home to, um, you know, the, the human predators, um, there were a number of fisheries disasters up and down the west coast. I've mentioned some of these in in California, we had um, you know, declines in, in sardine and other forage fish. The Dungeness crab fishery was, was massively impacted, as I mentioned. Uh, a number of salmon species from California on up into, into British Columbia and Alaska were impacted, and we had a collapse of the, of the cod uh, fishery up in the, in the North Pacific as well. So lots of impacts from this event or this, this series of, of events. So definitely what we saw was a climate stress test on our, uh, on our ecosystem. And um, a question we could ask is, is this the new normal? Is this what we're gonna be expecting to see more of in the future? Well, in fact, in 2019, uh, we did again see the development of a very large uh, marine heat wave, um, as you see in the, in the upper left there. Um, in fact, at its peak, I think the aerial extent of this heat wave was even larger than the blob. Um, and, you know, again, the, the media and the public are, are very in tuned and interested in this phenomenon. And, and you saw that again in the media with, you know, is the blob back? Um, uh, return of the warm water blob threatens marine life. Um, and so the other thing that, that, um, that we do, if, if you, you, when you get a chance, go to this website that I've, I've got here at the bottom. This is the California Current Integrated Ecosystem Assessment website. And my colleague, Andy Lysing, has um, created a blob tracker where you can look at maps like these um, in more or less real time 
and actually see what's going on out there in the Pacific and, and get some sort of sense of, is there a marine heat wave out there now? And how is it impacting our region? And one interesting metric that he's developed is this time series um, on the bottom here. This is showing the percent of the West Coast exclusive economic zone, so out 200 nautical miles, that is in heat wave status, with that being you know, above some uh, anomalous temperature threshold. And what we see is that during that, that blob period, 2015, 16, especially, uh, you know, we saw in some cases up to 100%, um, the entire West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington, EEZ impacted by heat waves. Um, so massive, you, you could understand why there was such a massive ecosystem response to that event. Things got a little bit back to normal again in 1718, um, but in 2019, as I mentioned, we saw another massive uh, marine heat wave, although it tended not to spend as much time near the, the coastal zone. And again, in two, uh, 2020 as well, we're seeing that. So um, in terms of the climate stress test, how have we done, what, what have we learned from this? Um, I would say that one of the, the key things that we've learned um, not that we didn't know it, but it, it, it reinforces this idea that NOAA and, and all of our partners really need to be especially vigilant in monitoring these events and also understanding them mechanistically. What are the physical conditions and characteristics and drivers of marine heat waves? And is there any level of predictability in these kinds of events? So NIMS has a number of surveys that, um, that go out pretty regularly uh, along the, the West Coast. Unfortunately, this year, COVID year, um, that's been scaled way back. So that's unfortunate. Um, but uh, with our partners, we're also um, you know, continuing to look at the, the growth and survival of California sea lion pups on San Miguel Island, uh, working with partners in the States to monitor demo demoic acid and harmful algal blooms, monitoring um, seabird die-offs and, and impacts of fisheries all along the West Coast. So I'll just summarize here, and, and as I um, tell you my summary there, the, the plot on the left is again from that blob tracker. This is the um, daily 2020 North Pacific sea surface temperature anomalies. And, and what you'll see as you look at that as the year uh, moves on uh, is again, this development of a very large scale um, and quite intense marine heat wave um, in the North Pacific. So we've experienced significant climate extremes in, in the California um, current system um, and surrounding region over the past several years. Of course, these marine heat waves that I mentioned, the drought, this El Nino, um, and these strong climate perturbations have had significant impacts on the structure and function of the California current marine ecosystem. And not just that, but also on the ocean dependent societies, the human societies that rely on those marine ecosystem services like fishing communities. We might expect uh, more of the same um, as we, as climate change becomes, you know, uh, more severe. Um, certainly we know that uh, the trend in, in ocean temperatures is upward, it's warming. Um, so we will definitely see more of these, these warm, uh, warm water events. And it speaks, I think, to the need for us to develop frameworks for um, developing a, a more nimble or climate ready um, ecosystem ecosystem-based management um, that can adapt to these um, large climate perturbations um, at the time scales and space scales in which they're actually occurring and affecting the ecosystem. So I think I will, um, I will stop there. And thank you again for uh, allowing me to speak. Great, excellent presentation, thank you. Um, let's go ahead and I will now introduce Dr. Jeanette Howard, who's going to transition us from marine into um, aquatic systems here. Uh, Dr. Howard is Director of Science for the Nature Conservancy California, based out of San Francisco, uh, where she provides scientific leadership for TNC's mission to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. Jeanette has been at the Nature Conservancy since 2006, first as California's North Coast eco-regional ecologist, and she now works with a broad array of partners to advance a sustainable water future for both people and nature in California, focusing on understanding environmental water needs and incorporating those needs into water management. 
And today, Dr. Howard will be talking about what we do and don't know about climate change impacts to freshwater species in California. All right, Dr. Howard, when you're ready, we can see the PowerPoint. Okay, great. I was having some trouble with my mute button. Can you can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, everybody. Um, the last speaker of the last panel of the day, I know there's a keynote coming up, but um, thanks everybody for, for uh, having interest and in this topic and for being here. I've, I've learned a lot. It's been a really um, fun couple of days. I actually feel like I've almost been at a conference for the past couple of days. Um, so yeah, I've been asked to talk with you about um, the impacts of climate change on the fresh our freshwater species. And it's a really good question. And one that I wish I um, I could answer as well as, as the other panelists, both yesterday and today. Um, we do have some good studies that predict watersheds that are most vulnerable to climate change, others that look at the watersheds that are the most resilient to climate change. We have some studies that are that have predicted how climate change will impact um, stream flows in our rivers. And um, a, predict a paper that came out on predictions of how climate change will impact salmonids um, based on kind of uh, consensus uh, of the, the experts in the field. There's a really cool recent study that um, uses museum records and citizen science that constructed a baseline to compare with recent observations of um, 34 odonate species. Those are dragonflies and damselflies across the year and, and, and how climate kind of impacts those distribution. But I'm not going to be talking to you about those things today. Um, there's a lot of things that we don't know, such as biological responses based on climate change. Um, and other, other reasons for biological responses. We, we don't know a lot about shifts in ranges or population abundance because we don't really do that good of a job in tracking, tracking most of our freshwater species in the state. I really wish we had a, a Grinnell survey, survey for freshwater species and we could um, work with Stephen on that. But um, so I'm gonna walk you through some of the things we, we know and what we don't know in trying to answer the question about um, freshwater biodiversity in the state. So first, um, what, we, what we do know and what we've well, there heard about the last couple of days about climate change um, and that Alex Hall yesterday put really succinctly um, is we are going to have an, an increase in scarcity during the dry times. The dries are gonna be drier an increase in winter storms in the wet times, the wets are gonna be wetter, wetter. We're gonna have more of both. And the reality is that it's not a perpetual land of scarcity that we sometimes think of, but one of variability and extremes. And as we try to manage water resources in the state for people and nature, a climate, climate change adds new challenges with these warmer temperatures that I anticipated, hotter summers, longer dry seasons, Losing snowpack, which is one of the three water storage mechanisms we have in, in the state, the other two being our reservoir system and groundwater, and increases in floods and droughts. We also have some basics about water and how it is managed in the state. Um, as you probably have heard, California is called the most hydrologically altered landmass on the planet, and it, and it is true. Um, we have 70% of 75% of the water, um, the available water, falls in the northern part of the th northern third of the state, while 80% of the urban and agricultural demands are in the southern two thirds of the state. So what we wind up doing is we move a lot of water. Um, we move a lot of water in the state, um, north to south, and east to west um, through such. Um, such things as Tuolumne's Hetch Hetchy that was mentioned earlier today. And we do a lot with that water. California, for example, has more irrigated acreage than any other state, thanks to these massive water storage projects that include dams, reservoirs, aqueducts, canals. And we have about half of our land mass, we have 100 million acres in the state and about half of it is in some form of agriculture. 
And the hub of that water transport system is, is in the Delta, which is the uh, nearly a thousand square mile um, Sacramento, San Joaquin Delta. Um, that's the largest estuary on the West Coast of Americas. That's where our two river systems, the Sacramento moving south, the San Joaquin moving north, um, meets for the Delta. And, and that hub provides water for 25 million Californians and millions of acres of farmland. So we move a lot of water. We also, we allocate a lot of water in the state to human uses. Um, this, this graphic here, this figure shows the percentage of runoff that falls in the state that is allocated um, at least on paper to water rights. And you can see some of those red those red lines represent between 100 and 1,000% of, of allocated water um, that falls in the state. So in short, um, we make our rivers really work here. We make our freshwater systems work to grow crops, water livestock, and people. And as a result of that development, um, California is a leading agricultural producer, a major manufacturing sector, and the most populated state in the country with the fifth or sixth or eighth largest economy in the world, depending on who you're talking to. And however, um, this intensive development has not been it without its consequences. Um, we've drained our wetlands, about 95% of our wetlands have been lost. We have um, a lot of invasive plants and, and animal species that have changed ecosystems and altered native habitat. And we have some extinctions um, that have occurred. And we also have altered um, the natural flow, the natural water flow patterns in the state. And I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, this slide shows, um, some hydrographs on the top and looking at water flowing through rivers at the course of the year. On the left is a, a natural, natural variable flow pattern that provides certain ecosystem functions. So for example, in, in our hydrology, these fall pulses um, increase longitudinal hydrologic connectivity and increases nitrogen cycling starts to decrease water temperatures, increases dissolved oxygen and triggers fish migration um, for our salmonids in the state. These wet season high flows um, perform a lot of functions in terms of scouring and depositing sediments and increasing um, habitat both for longitudinally as well as, as laterally with the riparian um, floodplains. The dry season base flows are really important for limiting the warming of water and um, maintaining habitat for those, for those species that depend on it. And on the right, you see kind of the decrease in that variability, this, this elimination of, of functional ecological flows. And our species in the state, our freshwater species have really evolved to this natural variability of our freshwater and our climate patterns of water in the state, both inter and intra annual variability. And while species, our freshwater species love variability, um, people don't. We need reliability and um, not a lot of variability. And so we've managed our systems to be a lot less variable and more somewhat reliable to meet the needs of, of people. This chart shows just one example of this. This is a Tuolumne River in 2015. Um, this is, it, the black line shows the unimpaired flows. Those are the, the amount of water that would flow in the river um, barring dams or water diversions. Um, and the red line shows what the river actually saw that year. And this is just one example, but that same pattern, pattern can be seen in a lot of our rivers in the state. This is another graph um, that shows the volume of water in the Tuolumne. And you see the natural variability of wet and dry years. I mean, there is really no normal in California when it comes to, to water and flows, as we know. Um, we have a lot of wet and dry, but, but again, as you can see here, these, these blue lines are the flows that remained in the river. The gray is what was diverted. And you could really see that we, we make our rivers work, right? Um, 
And this working of these rivers um, has really caused a lot of habitat loss and degradation that has impacted um, the state's freshwater species. So um, I'll just turn to that now of talking about freshwater species. And this is a paper we did a number of years ago now, but I'm still really proud of it because we, we, we took on the, the task of defining and identifying and looking at the distribution of freshwater species in the state. And I had been at TNC for about five years and kept looking around and thinking this had to have been done and then it wasn't. And um, was really grateful that I had the, um, the okay and the partners to actually put this together. So we identified um, 39 freshwater species in the state and compiled the spatial data and available conservation status to look at, at what's going on with our freshwater species in the state. And so what we found is that um, the species in the state um, by taxonomic group aren't doing too well. Um, this chart shows uh, the conservation of status by, by taxonomic group and the red, the dark red shows extinctions. The red is um, uh, listed species, vulnerable. And then the, the, um, the yellow color is where they're, they're kind of secure, the species. And then the light yellow shows species that haven't been evaluated. So you could see that half of the taxa um, in the state, the freshwater taxa in the state, at least for the ones that have been um, evaluated for conservation status are at risk of extinction. And, oops, sorry about that. Um, in looking at the endemic taxa, um, about 90% of our endemic freshwater species, which is around uh, nearly a thousand endemic freshwater taxa are at risk of e extinction. Unfortunately, we don't know um, a, a lot of, in terms of trend data, um, we, we don't follow a lot of these species, um, evaluate them. So yeah, that's one thing, we'd love to see the state develop a, a monitoring plan for, for, and an index for freshwater species to, and, and also to increase the, the number of stream gauges in the state um, so, so we could better um, know what, what's flowing in our rivers. So um, that's kind of a, a look at California species. And this, these kind of freshwater species declines are not unique to California. We see this happening with freshwater species globally. I don't mean to be a bummer, but um, yeah, this just is the reality that this is. This is the chart that was put out a while ago, um, but it's a compilation of three indices that World Wildlife Fund puts together. Um, and then looking at this same index divided into regions around the globe, you see, um, you see this happening all across the, the globe. Um, we do see a bump in North America around 1975, which coincides with the enactment of the Clean Water Act. But this bump then levels off uh, around 10 years later and we see these declines pick up. So um, was a great part of a solution, but, but not the panacea. So let me get to, um, to something around collecting some dots with climate change. So while um, attributing freshwater species declines or conservation status would be difficult at this point, given stresses already on our freshwater systems in the state, we do have a, an example of a potential climate change scenario in that same place as San Francisco Bay Delta. Um, this graph shows the flow of water out of the, the Delta and into the San Francisco Bay estuary. The top graphic shows the unimpaired flows. Again, what, what water would reach the estuary between February and June um, if there were no dams and diversions upstream and they're color coded for wet above normal, below normal, dry and critical years. So the blue is wet and the black is critically dry. Um, and then the bottom graphic shows what the San Francisco Bay Estuary actually experienced. And you could see that a lot of a lot more black in terms of what the, the ecosystem actually experienced as opposed to what the um, precipitation or flows would have been had there not been um, dams, diversions upstream. Um, looking at 
the same data now just between the years 1975 to 2014, um, you can see that a little bit clearer that in the last 40 years, there was only one year um, in 1977 that had an unimpaired flow that would have been in the super critical category, super critically dry category. However, what the estuary experienced was a supercritical drought in 48% of the years. So you could say that we've created a, a case study for what would happen in a prolonged drought, kind of a potential climate change scenario um, of how we've managed this, this system. Um, we have some data um, on various species in the Delta over time. Um, these are species abundances for Delta smelt and longfin smelt. You could see um, kind of a decline of those species. This is, these are species that eat zooplankton. We see the same for bass and starry flounder. These are species that eat zooplankton and fish. Um, shrimp and um, zooplankton that eat phytoplankton. And then our winter run Chinook, um, which eats insects and fish. And then also one of the indicators of the climate change indicators that the OEHHA uses, which is fall run Chinook. And you can see this um, declining trend there. So we basically have seen a, a, a decline or a collapse of species across trophic levels life across life history stages and habitat needs. And there what is one thing that, that is common to all of these, which is um, the abundance is have been correlated with, with flow. So uh, whether they're native or um, invasive species. So there is one commonality there and that's the amount of flow that's, that's getting out into the Delta. So, um, so to sum it up, um, climate change doesn't just add new challenges, um, but it interacts with our past and current water management and, and human modifications of the landscape. As, as Benjamin um, Hatchett yesterday in the first session, I think said, um, we have an inherited multipliers that make adaptation to climate change difficult. Um, we are losing freshwater species in the state at an alarming rate. We have a, a freshwater biodiversity crisis on our hands, and it's difficult to attribute those changes to biodiversity to climate change. Um, what we do know is our current strategies to reduce variability and our inability to adapt and make decisions uh, for freshwater species is a bigger is a big threat to freshwater species. So I, I'll, I'll go out on a limb here um, and say that our inability to adapt our management of freshwater resources to protect freshwater biodiversity is a greater threat than a greater threat to freshwater species than, than the expected um, changes in temperature, temperature or precipitation um, impacts due to climate change. And, and as um, Stephen, Scott Stevens said about the forest, I think this provides us with opportunities to do a better job at building a sustainable water future for California and one that includes the needs of freshwater biodiversity as well as the people in the state. And it, and it really is time to now to improve those conditions if we wanna see our freshwater species persist um, into the future. So with that, I will, We'll end my talk and thank you for listening and um, look forward to the discussion. Great, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our panelists for wonderful presentations, um, a lot of great content to discuss. And uh, thanks to all of you for hanging in there. As uh, Jeanette was mentioning earlier, I realized we're the, the session right after lunch and that the food coma may be sitting in. Um, so hang with us. We've got um, a good amount of time for discussion today. So please do type your questions into the Q&A box and um, we'll begin to, to relay those. Um, I do have a couple to kick us off here while you're continuing to type those questions in. So I'll go ahead and, and pose this to our panelists. I think the first question could really be to, to any of you. 
Um, and the question is, what is the gold standard for attributing climate change as a cause for biodiversity change? And Dr. Ackerley kind of touched on that a little bit this morning about how, you know, in his view, it's kind of a two-step process to get from actually observing an impact and then tying it to climate change and, you know, anthropogenic causes. So I, I would pose that question again to you and, and what do you view as the gold standard for making those connections? Well, I'll jump in there. Um, can you hear me all right? All right, yeah. great. Um, I would say that uh, you've got to be able to compare multiple kinds of causes of decline or causes for change. So you, you can have climate and climate change covariates, whether it be related to temperature, precipitation, and so forth. But you also have to have other threats that you consider against these in order to ascertain, um, in order to ascertain change. It would be great if you could connect some of the changes mechanistically. So that's a challenge, um, partly because uh, we have frequently thought that climate change primarily acts indirectly on many species by affecting relationships with other species. So phenology is a good example of that, where the food resources now uh, for a species might be emerging sooner and is the migratory bird coming back to time with that well or not. And um, we had a, a good example of where maybe sometimes those mismatches uh, that Professor Ackerley was talking about could be responsible for population declines. In other cases, those get hooked back up again over time. So, mm -hmm. um, so that that predator-prey interaction recalibrates. So I guess the question becomes, you know, the connections are many where climate can interact. And can we explore the mechanisms about them, you know, in a different, in addition to the the general patterns. I actually have a, I have a quick follow up to that because I had made a note um, during your presentation, um, Steve, about those kind of indirect impacts of climate change because you and I think Dr. Bograd also gave um, examples of individual species whose ranges are beginning to shift into new areas and you know that gets you thinking about what species are they now coming in contact that they maybe were or weren't before and have we observed those changes and those impacts and is that something that we could capture and how could we even you know go about that or maybe that's premature but well, it might be it might be early yet, but we're we're certainly you know starting to see those kinds of movements taking place, range some range mm -hmm. expansions um, and some range contractions as well that have taken place. Um, the the species interactions part, um, you know, uh, we probably have some examples of those. Thinking about uh, in the marine environment, maybe. Um, killer whales turning up in places where they hadn't been before, um, finding, uh, you know, finding prey species. Is that related to climate change? I don't know. Wolf reintroduction is going to have Im impacts in places that didn't have before. Does that have a climate change connection? Probably not. Um, so it becomes, it's definitely, you know, ascribing causal change is definitely a challenge. One way that we can do it is, of course, there are some, some systems that are amenable to experimentation. You know, um, sometimes that tends to be uh, mesocosms in laboratory settings. Sometimes it could be through and with plants, garden transplant experiments where people move the plants around um, into different environments. Uh, that's not very far from managed translocation that we start thinking about as, as a treatment uh, to, to assist us with climate change responses. So um, I guess to say that we can expect those kinds of changes taking place in our ecosystems. 
and that we've probably always had some of those kinds of changing species interactions happening as well. Um, the question is, will we have enough resilience in those systems for species and for the system to keep its functions? I just want to uh, add a comment to, to your question too, in terms of you know what, what's a gold standard for um, discerning climate change. And, and I would take it again from, from Dr. Beisinger's talk um, that what you really need is a long baseline, a very long time series in which you can really sample a lot of variability and begin to differentiate some natural variability from you know more anthropogenic climate change related um, variability. And you know in the marine realm, um, we have fewer of those really long time series. We have some like the Cal Coffee um, data from, from Southern California mostly, um, but that's really the gold standard. We need long baselines. All right. Um, I'm gonna ask the question um, to you, Dr. Bograd, while you're, while you're here. Um, this question went through the chat box and I just noticed that you had already answered it, but I thought if you wouldn't mind kind of sharing this with the, the larger group. Um, the question was about what caused the increase in whale entanglements that you observed. And I thought your answer was an interesting one. Yeah, well, it was it was kind of, you know, a perfect storm of events um, in which, um, you know, we had this really, really warm waters related to the, the blob. Um, offshore, um, and the cool, productive waters were really, really compressed, um, very near shore. Um, and in that very small um, habitat area is where you ended up seeing a lot of the forage fish, like anchovy, for example. Um, so humpback whales that might normally feed further offshore on krill and other species, um, they were actually going into that near shore area um, to, to feed on anchovy. That's also where the crab fishery happens to operate. So, um, you know, invariably you you got some interactions um, between um, that fishery and 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 the fishing gear, the crab pots, um, and those whales. Again, mostly humpback whales, but others as well, um, which resulted in some entanglements. Um, so again, it was kind of like a, a perfect storm of of events, and 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 the timing of when the um, the fishery was opened was such that that was just when the humpback whales were migrating through the region as well. So. All right, we'll see. Um, next question here, um, I'm gonna stick with you, Dr. Bograd, for a second. We've got another question that came in. Um, Julia asks, what do you see as the best ways we might use um, the Cal Coffee data set towards the goal of climate ready fisheries? That's that's a really that's a really good question. Um, and mm -hmm. you know, talking about gold standards, I think at least in the marine realm, I think the Cal Coffee data is a gold standard. There's actually uh, what is it now? Uh, over seventy years that they've been um, sampling the the coastal uh, regions of the California Current, the the physics, the biology, the mm -hmm. chemistry. Um, we have an over seventy year record of um, ichthyoplankton. Um, series, for example, where we could actually start looking now. Um, and there are folks um, down in La Jolla, Andrew Thompson, I know, um, who's looking at range shifts um, in those uh, different species and, and seeing are there changes in distributions of the warm water versus the cool water ichthyoplankton species. Mm -hmm. We actually have a long enough time series, 70 years, that we, we can, I think, actually start to discern um, some climate-driven change associated with that. Mm -hmm. It's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> all right, this is a question I think um, could really be good for all of you. Um, and the question is, can we identify climate-driven ecosystem thresholds or tipping points? So we talked about, you know, several different ecosystem types today. So maybe, maybe you can share your thoughts on if and how those could be identified. Well, that's a tough one, isn't it? All of us, uh, nobody's unmuting up there, I'm noticing, of my colleagues jumping <laughs> in on this one. Um, 
I guess, you know, cl these climate driven thresholds, um, you know, I think in a way that's sort of what we identified for the birds in the Mojave, where we've seen this long term, you know, this large decline across so many species in a community. But at the same time, we don't see it for the small mammals. You know, so what um, what do we mean by an e ecosystem threshold in that sense? You know, it is going to be is is a challenge for us, um, and part of it again may be that how we think about um, about exposure within the ecosystem to. I think we may have lost him for a minute. So maybe others can help. You know, I, I think I think that's really the key question. Um, you know, what what are the, the important thresholds um, um, or tipping points um, for different ecosystem components? And we've thought about, you know, can we answer that with this this marine heat wave, these climate extremes that we saw? And it's really hard because we don't really know, I think, enough, or maybe we do in some cases. Um, really what the uh, adaptive capacity of a lot of these species are. Um, I would say that in terms of ocean chemistry, I think we can definitely um, find tipping points or thresholds where, um, you know, ocean acidification gets to a, a certain level or um, you get these hypoxic events uh, in the ocean um, and there are species that just simply cannot survive those conditions and either have to move or, or will suffer. Um, so I think those are a little easier to identify as tipping points, but, but otherwise I think it's quite quite a difficult challenge. Yeah, I think it's really difficult and and also um, I mean we we can we've seen tipping points um, in systems from kind of you know depending on what it is right you see tipping points in rivers where where you disconnect habitat or you dry habitats and I would say that's a tipping point but to think about that there's some climate signal or some, some tipping point that would be uh, a tipping point for across the board. Um, I think that'd be hard to say for the freshwater systems. I think we've seen multiple tipping points though um, in certain systems mm -hmm. where um, we've changed uh, rivers from uh, ephemeral to uh, intermittent or what have you, right? So. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question. I wish there was some bullet, magic bullet and answer so that we could do something about it, but I, I don't think that's, I don't, I don't think there is one. Dr. Howard, I have a quick follow-up for you. Um, this is more of a quick uh, technical question about your presentation. Where is the picture taken of the yeah. no diving off the bridge? Right. I just, oh, no. um, I just, I, I drew a big blank. Um, this was a, it was a stock ish, a stock image we got from California and I'm just looking through my files mm -hmm. to find out where it is. So I don't know. I didn't take it. <laughs> to, to be determined. Um, oh, well, I'll ask you another question. Then. Um, the question for you, Jeanette, is at least in the Delta, um, do you see lack of fish screens and screen technology as also a factor in decreasing native or at risk fish species? Um, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, if you have multiple diversions, um, pulling juvenile salmonids onto your field or sturgeons or what have you. Yeah, exactly. I think fish screens have been a good deterrent for, um, keeping fish in, in the, the rivers, um, in the Delta. Um, certainly we've, we've seen that be really useful. And, and I know that fish screens are really expensive also. So it's a difficult, um, a difficult thing to have people to put that kind of expense with their diversions to keep fish um, where they should be. Yeah. All right, I want to send a question your way, Joanna. Um, we have questions about kind of what are the most vulnerable species and um, thinking about um, Dr. Bogart's comment about adaptive 
capacity and how that's something that is a factor in vulnerability but can be very difficult to determine. Um, how do you uh, kind of address that in, in, in your studies of birds? And I think sometimes people tend to think that they are the most adaptive because they're able to travel, you know, far and wide, but that's, you know, not necessarily always the case. So what, what kind of considerations have you had to take into account in your work in terms of kind of adaptive capacity when you're looking at vulnerability? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. When, when we looked at the adaptive capacity, we only we're able to look at the proportion of potential range gain to range loss. And so we, we assess vulnerability based on that alone. It would have been nice to look at species traits and species interactions, but there's too many unknown variables to be able to predict that accurately. So there's certainly a lot of unknowns and that's why we're um, representing our data as, as a potential vulnerability. But that said, we did incorporate as much as we could like species dispersal distances, natal dispersal in the spring. Some birds can fly farther than others. Some are, are um, long distance migrants and some are more resident species that stay in the same place all year round. So, so those are some look into as well as associating, associating them with, with habitat conditions, right? So um, in the future, if the boreal forest is projected to shift northward a little bit, then will the species be able to keep up with, with those shifts? Are they adaptive? Are they potentially keeping up with um, habitat shifts and all that? And so we found that the, our Arctic species living in Arctic areas, areas and boreal and Western forest and water bird species came out to be our most vulnerable species groups. And that might make sense to you because Arctic species in summer have nowhere else to, to, to adapt to. They can't. Um, they're limited by by pole word movements. Um, and one of our least vulnerable groups is generalist and urban and arid species, which might also make sense to you as um, a lot of arid areas become more dry and more hot. They that is to have relatively less impact on species already adapted to those conditions than species who are not adapted. Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, I'm gonna kick it back to, to you, Dr. Bograd. Um, the question is, we've talked a lot about, I guess, kind of pace and scales, time scales of, of these different impacts unfolding. And so um, the question is, what is the response time of different ecosystem components of the California current ecosystem to climate perturbation? And is that something that you can can you comment on? Well, it's it's. I would comment that that's a really good question, and <laughs> I would like to know the answer to it. Um, you know, obviously, with the lower trophic levels, the the phytoplankton uh, response, the zooplankton response was was quite quick, and is usually quite quick. Um, but for for a number of the species, um, it, it could be quite prolonged. I mean, species that uh, you know may recruit to a fishery two, three, four years after this event, um, you know, we won't know until that time whether, you know, what the, the actual impact was on that particular species. Um, you know, for example, salmon that were entering the ocean in 2015 or 16 uh, into unproductive and, and warmer waters, when they return, you know, three years later, um, they're probably going to be in much smaller numbers. In fact, I think they already are. Um, so I think it depends on the species and their particular life history. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, it, it's an interesting question to, to study a little more. Another big one. We're giving all the, all the heavy hitters today for everyone on the panel. All right. Um, so the next question I wanted to ask, um, actually building on Joanna's response, she talked about some indicators that connect people to science and, and kind of inspire them to action. Um, maybe Jeanette and Stephen and Steve, if he's back on, could you maybe comment on that with some in the environments that you work in, um, things that can help people to make those connections? Or indicators, I guess, that you think will, can help to inspire action and, and potentially change some of our behaviors. Yeah, I'm back. Um, 
the internet decided to come back on, I guess. Um, you know, people are inspired by the things they love and the things that affect their everyday life. Um, mm. And the noise, so to speak, from the rest of humanity that they hear around them. And so uh, I used to say that basically the Arctic was ground zero for climate change, but we're taking over that spot in California with, with the fires and so forth. What I think does inspire people will be the connections that they can see with their lives. Fresh water has got to be an important one, you know, as we're about to, you know, um, perhaps run into another really difficult time in the, in the future, unless we start getting some rain this winter. Um, people are going to be experiencing the fresh water kinds of indicators. In terms of biodiversity indicators that they that they are interested in, I, that's harder to say. I, I do think, as Joanna said, you know, birds are inspiring for a lot of people. You know, um, so it's got to be something for them that they can detect, that they can see, that they can interact with. Um, and at the same time, you know, um, uh, feel that that uh, there is a connection to climate, not just the turkeys that have expanded in everybody's backyard over the last 20 years. Um, it's got to be something that actually has a has a climate change connection that that can be a little bit harder to identify. Kind of a somewhat of a subjective kind of value judgment question for sure. Um, all right, well, we have um, just a couple of minutes here before we have to wrap up. So I, I wanted to end with this question and it's one that um, has been asked in several other sessions in the workshop. So I think it's important to pose it here. And that is um, seeing as this you know, workshop is gonna contribute to the development of the next indicator report. What other indicators related to biodiversity do you think might be useful to add to the report that maybe we're not already capturing or tweaks that we could make to the existing indicators that that would be helpful? Does anything anything come to mind for you? Yeah, I mean, this is a topic that I think would be good to discuss with you all um, coming up. I think um, there's a, a bioassessment database for freshwater species. I mean, you. The, the Chinook salmon you have as an indicator um, is, you know, a little bit fraught, right? Because it's it's not going to be responding to climate change. I was thinking that it might be interesting to expand it to include some of the um, the bioassessment data that's been going on in the state for a while to look at what is expected versus what is observed in a lot of these um, places that are more reference conditions. I think that would be an interesting addition to the indicators perhaps um, to be incorporating a data set that's already out there and that DFW um, through the swamp database works on. I think that would be an interesting maybe uh, incorporating that that bioassessment data set for macroinvertebrates um, to look at changes in expected versus observed, especially in these reference um, condition uh, re reference condition sites. Mm -hmm. I would say that, you know, in the previous report, I, I don't think there was much of anything necessarily about marine heat waves. Um, it's really become a, a big a hot topic, it's a bad pun, sorry, um, in, in recent years. So I definitely think having that in the report, some, some metric of um, marine heat wave intensity or aerial extent or impact um, in the coastal zone is, it would be really important. Um, and then some of the biological responses um, or impacts on that, um, like harmful algal blooms, um, I think would be really important to, to report on as well. Yep, definitely. Any other, any other thoughts, comments before we close uh, it out today? Well, sort of connecting, connecting your last two questions in a way together. Um, and, and some of the things you talked about early on, I think that, um, with climate change, you do have to have a long-term record. 
So indicators are something that we'd like to see built, be able to build upon a past set of information, but also something that we would likely continue to get information about in the future. That information is going to come from both planned surveys like Cal Coffee or like the periodically repeated Grinnell resurvey. And somebody else does it in about 25 years and climate change has really kicked in. But it's also going to come from citizen science, as Joanna told mm -hmm. us. And citizen scientists are going to be making contributions of data that will require some smart statistical approaches to be able to work with them in ways to be useful mm -hmm. indicators for climate change. So just about anything that we're seeing collected um, in that framework could be a useful indicator, especially since something that's a species or a group of species that are changing in one ecosystem with climate might not be shifting so much in another. Mm -hmm. uh, there mm -hmm. seems to be lots of contingencies in where species are responding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay, I think that's the sign. Uh, we've, we've hit our time limit today. So before um, I turn it over to our read, I just want to thank all of you so much for attending and all of our panelists for a great presentation. So thank you so much. This is wonderful. Um, and I'll turn it back to you.